Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we are continuing from the last two weeks in Ephesians 1, verses 17 through the first half of 19. And this message is entitled, The Knowledge of God, and we are on part 3 of The Knowledge of God from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through the first half of 19. Now, we have been looking at the importance of knowledge and the knowledge of God specifically, and we have concluded from the last two weeks, number one, that there is a serious problem in churches today, and generally in evangelical churches, there is a low view on learning the Bible and gaining biblical literacy. That's a serious problem because you cannot love God, as we have concluded, without knowing basic facts about him. You have to know something about him to be able to properly love him, to properly serve him. And so last week we began looking at, in verse 17, the first part of the knowledge of God, and that was the request for knowledge. We started looking at the request for knowledge, and that's as far as we got. There's a lot that can be said in a lot of material there. Um, but we see this primarily, this request, in the words, look with me here in verse 17, it says that, that can also be uh, um, translated in order that, it's showing purpose, in order that God, and then the words may give, in order that God may give, from verse 17, shows the request. Now it's a purpose statement. But as I said last time, if I went to somebody who had something I wanted and I said, I am talking to you in order that you may give this to me, it's a roundabout way of asking for it. It is a request, even though it is framed in a purpose statement. So that's where we're getting the request for knowledge. Paul is requesting something on behalf of the Ephesians. And we contrasted, or actually first, we saw why we can bring requests to God. Why are we even able to ask God for things we want? And we concluded the reason is he is omnipotent. And we just looked at three basic categories. Number one, he has power over life and death. Jesus Christ has the keys to death and Hades. He has power over life and death. He's the one ultimately who has authority over everything. He has power over the cosmos was the other thing we saw. He is the one who has placed every star in its place, who has created every planet, who has created the entire universe. And we also saw that he has power over the seasons. He is the one who keeps an order to the seasons, who brings rain, who allows the sun to fit into a system and cycle, and that we can expect tomorrow certain things about our universe because of that, because God is over it and he's in control. If he has power over all those things and those things are just little things to him, we can ask him for anything. That does not mean he will automatically grant it to us, but he has the power to grant whatever he wishes. And then we contrasted God's power and God's nature with other concepts of God. There's so many we could look at, but we just looked at two basic ones that would have been in and around uh, the Mediterranean area at that time. And there's the Arab concept of jinns. Jinns, we know them popularly by the term genie. And so a lot of people have sort of this attitude or idea in different pagan cultures, had this attitude or idea of relating to God or to these spirit beings, they're not the same as angels in Mus- or in Islam, um, but they would be, they would be, um, they would be mortal beings who who uh, could grant things if the person who was who who knew them could force them by talismans and rituals to get them to grant their wishes. Brian, can we back up? We're only on the request for knowledge right now just in verse 17. So the request for knowledge. There's also, so that would be like the Arab, Mesopotamian region, Middle Eastern concept, or some type of concept like that. We also saw the Roman concept, which would have been prevalent at that time. And that is, excuse me, and that is um, 
the Roman concept of Pax Deorum. Pax Deorum meant peace with the gods, peace with the gods. The Roman culture and society viewed their human or humankind's relationship to the gods as sort of a delicate equilibrium and that there always had to be this careful balance. And so they would go far out of their way to make sure all of their rituals were very precise and that they did everything exactly. And if they messed up one thing, they would start the whole ritual over because they didn't want to pray to the wrong God or ask the wrong thing or have the gods angry with them. And so they viewed everything that happened that was negative as an imbalance with the gods. So if someone gave birth to a disfigured child, they, they thought there's some imbalance with the gods with this person or with our society. If there was some natural disaster that destroyed a building or hurt people, they thought the gods were angry with them. And so their whole concept of relating to the gods was that they had to appease them carefully. That's not how we relate to God. God is pleased with all people in Jesus Christ simply because of Christ. We don't have to go to him in a, an automatically fearful way. Now, there might be reasons for fear in another area, but when we come before God and we make requests to him, he is pleased with Jesus Christ, and therefore he is pleased with us, and he will grant us our requests according to his will. Then we saw that there are two different, two basic kinds of requests. There are several words that bring out these ideas. The first kind of request is an urgent and desperate plea. We saw that one of these words that's used for this urgent and desperate plea is actually sometimes uh, a related word is translated as to beg or to be a beggar. And it has the idea that somebody is so concerned about something, uh, somebody is in such a trial and so helpless in the situation that they beg God for his help. Now, there's a place for that, and there are passages that use these words to talk of a believer in a very urgent trial coming before the Lord and begging of God to help him. But that's not the way Paul is talking here. This would probably fit better with the other type of request, and we see that exemplified in Jesus Christ's high priestly prayer from John 17, when it says, I ask on, when Jesus said, I ask on their behalf, the term for ask there was not this urgent begging asking. It was an intimate, personal, able, uh, this access that he has to the Father that he's able to ask freely because he has a close relationship with him. That's more the idea that I see here in verse 17 when Paul is asking of God, on, the, on behalf of the Ephesians, and by extension, us, he's not asking out of a fearful, desperate place. He's asking because he knows God can grant him his prayer request freely. And so that's the type of request we see here. And then we concluded by looking at Solomon's prayer request. Back when he started his rule, we, see, we saw this in 1 Kings chapter 3. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon comes before the Lord, he prays, and what does he ask for? He asks for, and this relates to our very topic here, he asks for wisdom, or as we see here, knowledge. Because he knew he was insufficient as a human to be able to lead these people, and he had concern that he would be like his father David and be able to rule them rightly before God. And what does verse 10 of 1 Kings 3 say? It says, God was pleased with that request. So asking for knowledge of God when motivated rightly is something God is pleased with. We can come before the Lord and ask him for knowledge. And that is what we're going to see here as we continue in verses 17 through the first half of 19. We will see just how we receive the request that Paul has made as we read in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you grant prayer requests, that you have the power 
to grant prayer requests and that you allow us as sinful people, but those who you've um, brought into relationship with you through Jesus Christ, that you allow us to ask things of you. Lord, I, I pray that each person here would grow in their prayer life with you and their ability to ask things that are according to your will. And Lord, we just pray that you would grant our requests, um, that you would grant them in a way that's most pleasing to you and that all the things that we add to our prayer list each week and the concerns that come through, Lord, you know these, you know our heart, you know that uh, sometimes these are deeply troubling things and we just ask that each of those would be lifted up to you and that you would um, help help each of us through those, help comfort and help um, heal and and reconcile and save and all the things that are listed there. Lord, we just ask that each of those would um, be put before you. We ask that you would uh, fulfill your will in those. Lord, we thank you so much that we have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. I pray that you would work in us to just even throughout the week to bring to mind others and that we would pray similar things and we would think about the spiritual walk of others, the physical concerns of others, and that those would be on our heart and minds first and foremost, even above our own personal concerns. Lord, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives, and we pray this in your name. Amen. So as we look at the request for knowledge that Paul has made in verse 17, we see there are two ways that we receive this knowledge. And the first way we receive the knowledge is from the Father. We receive the knowledge from the Father. And we see this in the words that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now, there's two phrases here that we have to look at. The first phrase is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a unique phrase. It's very unusual. Normally, in Paul's letters, as he opens up a letter, he will use a similar type of phrase to open his letters when he's making a greeting. He'll say something like, in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he'll say, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it emphasizes God our Father, that he's our God and he's our Father in most of these. We see this eight times. Romans 1, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 2 Corinthians 1, 2, Galatians 1, 3. We even have it here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, Philippians 1, 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, and Philemon 3. All contain that same construction from, or grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it emphasizes our personal relationship to God, that we have an intimate spiritual relationship with God, and then it also adds, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this phrase is altogether different here. Notice that it doesn't say God our Father. It says the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. It moves the our to the Lord Jesus Christ being ours, but who is who's God? Who, who is the Father God of? says he's God of Jesus here. And so there have been a lot of misunderstandings with, the, with this phrase because various uh, views of theology want to say that Jesus is a created being, that he is not God, that he is not deity. And they would use a verse like this to try to support that. But that's not what's going on here. And there are many passages we could look at that would show Christ's deity. It is thoroughly throughout all of Scripture all the way back in the Old Testament, especially in um, like Isaiah 9-6, but it is all throughout Scripture. What's going on here is something very interesting to the purpose of what Paul is writing in this passage. Paul is emphasizing Jesus' humanity. And so he does this actually, in, or actually the Scriptures themselves, but Paul in particular, do this in several places. Six times God the Father is called the God of Jesus. We see this in John 20, verse 17, Romans 15, 6, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Ephesians 1, 3. So we'll look at that in a second. 1 Peter 1, 3 and Revelation 1, 6. All say that God the Father 
is the God of Jesus. Now, let's look back at verse 3 of Ephesians 1. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In these other passages, that's the frequently used phrase. It'll say he's the God of Jesus and he's the Father of Jesus. What don't we have here in verse 17? We don't have the Father part except after it. So Paul moves the father part to an appositional phrase that is further describing. But he focuses on that God the Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's emphasizing Jesus' humanity. This we can see in another passage in John chapter 20, verse 17. Here's what it says in John 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, Notice this. This is what Jesus says to Mary Magdalene to go and say to the disciples. And he calls them my brethren. I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. Jesus is showing that, and this is after his resurrection, that because he has been raised from the dead, now humanity has an, it's not exactly an equal, but as far as humanly speaking, an equal access and relationship to God. The same God who is Jesus' God in his humanity, the same God who is Jesus' Father in Jesus' humanity, is our God and our Father. We have an equal family, spiritual relationship with God. And so Paul is honing in on that when he says, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus' humanity is the key to this whole section. It's the key to verses 3 through 14. Nothing that was accomplished in verses 3 through 14, these spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing that we have, none of those could be accomplished if Jesus was not human. We have that relationship with God because of Jesus' humanity. And then the latter part in verses 15 through 23 depend on Jesus' humanity, because look at what God has accomplished. And we're going to look at these in the weeks to come. But he raised him from the dead in verse 20 and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Those two things, well, it's basically three things, resurrected, ascended, and then seated at his right hand. All three of those are in Jesus' humanity. See, Jesus already had that place in his deity. But never before in history, number one, has God become a human being. But has a human being, a lowly... Now, Jesus wasn't fallen like we were. He didn't have a sin nature. But he had a body that was dying and wearing out just like ours. Has a human being been exalted to sit at the right hand of the Father? And so that's what we're going to look at in the weeks ahead. And so Paul is honing in on that fact or that aspect of Jesus Christ's humanity. So God the Father is the God of Jesus and Jesus' humanity, the same as he's our God. And so that's a, it's just an interesting thing we see here that Paul brings out. And this is going to help us if we want to know God better. We want to know these types of things about God. Paul goes on to explain in the next phrase, this is a further describing phrase. We call it an appositional phrase. It's further describing who this God is. He's called the Father of glory, the Father of glory. We see similar phrases. Uh, there's only a few of these phrases in all of Scripture. Twice in Scripture, God is called the God of glory. We see that in Acts chapter 7, verse 2. Um, Stephen, when he's um, making his testimony against the Pharisees, he says, and he said to, and he said, hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. That phrase, the God of glory, is not used anywhere else in the New Testament, only there. And it harkens back to uh, Psalm 29, verse 3, which says, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord is over many waters. Talking about God's powerful and glorious being. And so that's a phrase that's unique. There are a couple of other phrases used in the New Testament that are related. 
The Lord of glory is used in 1 Corinthians 2.8 to refer to Jesus when he was crucified. The Lord of glory. And then the only other phrase like this speaks of the spirit of glory in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. So all three members of the Godhead are called, we have here, the Father of glory, Jesus in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, the Lord of glory, and then in 1 Peter, the Spirit of glory. So this term glory is applied to all three persons of the Godhead. We also see that glory has already been something Paul is discussing in this chapter. Verse 6, what does he say? To the praise of the glory of his grace. In verse 12, what does he say? To the praise of his glory. In verse 14, again, to the praise of his glory. Glory brings praise. Glory is an esteemed position. It is something we recognize about God. And it is an important theme in the scriptures. When Moses and Israel completed the tabernacle in the Old Testament, what was the first thing that happened in it? Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 35, this is what it says. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we see God's glory and the tabernacle are intimately linked. And this is where this concept, you've probably heard the term Shekinah glory comes from. Now, this is a a concept that was later developed by rabbis after uh, the scriptures were completed. But we can see this is a biblical concept. We see it right here in Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40 uses the term, what is the term for tabernacle in the Old Testament and Hebrew? It's Mishkan, which is related to Shekinah. You hear that similarity? Shekinah, Mishkan. To dwell. It's a dwelling place. It's a tent. It's somewhere where God lives among the people. And so, also, it says that his glory filled that dwelling place. That term for glory is kavod in Hebrew. Kavod comes from a term that means something that is heavy or weighty. We actually see it Uh, a form of it used one of the earliest times in Genesis 12, verse 10. This is what it says. Now, there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Kavod. Now, it's a slightly different usage of it, but kavod, something heavy, something weighty, ended up being used to speak of something very serious, and God's glory is something extremely serious. It is something that should be treated with the uh, utmost seriousness and importance. And we see this type of reaction in Eli, the priest's reaction, when he heard about the Ark of the Covenant being taken by the Philistines. Now, what happened? In 1 Samuel chapter 4, Israel is at war with the Philistines. And the Philistines are winning. And so what does Israel conclude? They conclude that they need the Ark of the Covenant to go to battle with them. Because from previous experience, when they bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle, which God had commanded them several times to do already, they start defeating their enemy. So they think, if we just bring this wooden chest, this, this, uh, this ornate structure with us into battle, we will be able to defeat the Philistines. And so... Um, in 1 Samuel 4, they bring the, the uh, Hophni and Phinehas, that's Eli's two sons, bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle, and the Philistines are fearful. But the end result is not good. So here's what happens in verse 13 of 1 Samuel 4. It says, when he came, behold, and this is this messenger coming back to tell Eli what happened in this battle after they brought the Ark of the Covenant. Eli was sitting on his seat by the road eagerly watching because his heart was trembling, not for his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that went into battle. He wasn't trembling over that. For the ark of God, Eli was trembling and waiting. Remember, the ark of the covenant is a part of the tabernacle. God's glory fills this dwelling place, this tabernacle, 
and sits upon the Ark of the Covenant. The two are intimately linked. And so Eli is fearful about the Ark of God. Verse 17, Then the one who brought the news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. So he gets the news that his two sons have died in bringing the Ark of the Covenant into battle. But get this. This is what it says. And the Ark of God has been taken. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. Thus, he judged Israel 40 years. When did Eli die? Did he die? Did he have this reaction when he found out that Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons, had died? Or did he react when he found out that the Ark of the Covenant was taken? He reacted to the latter. And he died. It was so disturbing and troubling to him that he fell over and died because of it. Eli and the people of Israel, some of them, had a very serious attitude about the Ark of the Covenant because they understood the importance of God's glory and God's presence. Further down in the passage, we see the seriousness brought out and now the response of Phineas's widow. It happened that Phineas's wife was pregnant at this time. Now, he goes into battle with the Ark of the Covenant, and he dies. Now she's a widow. How does she react? Well, when she hears about, uh, when she heard that the Ark was taken, and that her father-in-law and husband had died, she went into labor and began giving birth. It was extremely troubling to her. And what happens in verse 21 of 1 Samuel chapter 4, 21 and 22 say this. And she called, this is the child she gave birth to, she called the boy Ichabod, Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of the God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God was taken. Ichabod might sound familiar based on the word that we just talked about before, kavod. Ichabod, ikavod means it's a negated form of kavod. If it's heavy, it's glorious, it means no glory, no weight to it. Uh, it's, it's a very troubling situation to be in, that the glory of God has been taken. And so she named her own son, no glory. Or, in other words, we could say shame. Her son was named shame, no glory. That's how serious they treated it. Okay, and then we see in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, What do we see right from the very beginning? We see God's glory being manifested in these amazing visions that Ezekiel is describing. And the context is Ezekiel had been taken in the second deportation from Israel. This is 597 B.C. And they're looking toward this final deportation, Babylon attacking Jerusalem in 586. And the book is warning Jerusalem and the people that are in captivity, warning them about what is going on in Judah. So in Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel has this vision. And this vision is that he sees the temple. Now, he first sees the 70 elders who were like a precursor. They're based on Moses handing that authority on to 70 different elders. And they're a precursor to the Sanhedrin. They're not the Sanhedrin. But they're in the temple. And what does he see? He says, He sees idols and uh, detestable creatures everywhere in the temple. And they are each worshiping these idols. And the reason they say they're doing this is that God can't see because he's forsaken Israel. So if God's forsaken Israel, they believe he can't see us anymore. And they're doing whatever they want in the temple and around the temple. And then as he goes out in the temple courtyard, he's seeing the same things. People are weeping over false gods and idols. All throughout the temple, there was idolatry going on in this vision. And so then we get to Ezekiel chapter 9. And this helps to explain, why is God going to utterly destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple? Because the people are as wicked as could be at this point. And so we see in Ezekiel chapter 9, as God explains, in preparation for destroying everything in Jerusalem, He begins to remove himself, his Shekinah, his dwelling glory from the temple. 
Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3 says, Then the glory of the Lord of Israel went up from the cherub. What's the cherub? It's that top of the Ark of the Covenant. The glory went up from there, on which it had been, to the threshold of the temple. That's the entrance of the temple. So God's glory has just moved itself one step closer to outside the temple compound. And he, and he called to the man clothed in linen to, uh, whose loins was, writing, was the writing case. Okay, and that's speaking of this man who is going to now go and mark people who are going to be protected and then slaughter everyone else. And so this is in preparation for these events. God's glory is beginning to move out of the temple. Then just a little bit down in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, it says, Then the glory of the Lord, if he went from the cherub, the Ark of the Covenant, to the threshold, the door of the temple, now it says, departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. That's these, these uh, angels that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1, this vision of these four beasts. And it went and stood over these cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. So now the glory of the Lord has moved another step much further to the gate of the temple compound, the courtyard. And so the glory is about to completely leave. When the glory leaves, God is no longer Because his glory represents him. God is no longer dwelling with them and among them. He's no longer tabernacling with them. And then the next chapter describes the very next step in Ezekiel chapter 11, 22 and 23 says, Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain which is east of the city. That's the Mount of Olives. And that's it. And God's glory left Israel. God's glory was completely removed from the temple so that when Babylon came in and destroyed the city, God had already departed from them. They were no longer being treated with this protective care that God had over them. To lose God's glory is shameful. It is ikavod. It is no glory. It is shame. In the New Testament, glory is the word voxa. That's what we see here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. When it says, the father of glory, the term is voxa. This is related to the Greek word vokeo, to think. So, for God to be glorious is to have a certain thought about him, to esteem him. The way we think about people is either their glory or their shame. If they have a good reputation, if we think highly of them, we are seeing their glory or we are esteeming them as having glory. God's glory, because this idea of to think was associ- became associated with the outward appearance of a person. So if someone was attractive looking or something, then they would be glorious. They would be treated with glory. And so it came to be associated with things that were very attractive. Think of like Aurora Borealis or some really bright, radiant type of lights. You look at those and you just think that's glorious. The psalm says the heavens declare God's glory. Why? Because you look at those and the lights and everything, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And so God's glory is associated with light. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 1. So thinking about the very beginning of the book of Ezekiel, this concept of glory is the thing that God establishes. Because if God is going to call Ezekiel to pronounce these judgments and these prophecies upon Israel, he needs him to understand just how serious his glory is so that he can remain committed to the task because what Ezekiel had to do was a very difficult ministry. And so he had to remain committed. So God shows himself in a vision to Ezekiel. And this is one of the descriptions that Ezekiel gives. It says, Now above the expanse, there was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli. That's a sapphire type of stone a bright, radiant blue. So this throne was just covered in sapphire blue in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward something like glowing metal that looked like fire 
all around within it, and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow and the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Listen to this illustrative language. God's glory being described as this appearance of a rainbow, glowing metal, uh, the throne being this bright sapphire blue. God's glory is associated with beautiful, glowing light. It says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. First Timothy chapter six, verses 15 through 16 say, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality. And here's the key and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God is glorious. He dwells in unapproachable light. The idea is, and this is brought out in several passages, uh, John 1.18 says, no man has seen God at any time. That we can, human beings in history have seen theophanies. They have seen visions of God. They have seen depictions of God. They cannot see God. His glory is unapproachable light. It would kill a person, as God told Moses in Exodus chapter 33. And so, God is glorious in a radiant and glowing way, but God's glory is also associated with darkness. And so this might seem to be a contradiction, but we have to understand that these are two aspects to bring out just what God's glory. When we see the term Father of glory, what does it mean? That God the Father is the Father of glory. Well, he's also associated with darkness. This is brought out in several ways. You think all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant, when God put Abraham to sleep, and he passed between the animal carcasses by himself, how did he appear? He didn't appear as a man walking through these carcasses. He appeared as a smoking furnace and a flaming torch, which is also similar to to how he led the people of Israel after the Exodus, as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So there's something to do with this cloud, this darkness. And even when, uh, when Abram was put to sleep before God passed through those carcasses, it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. There is something terrifying about God's glory. If we really understood it, that's why in Isaiah 6, Isaiah is troubled and says, woe am I, a man of unclean lips. Because once you actually begin to see a real depiction of God's glory, it is terrifying knowing the contrast. So there's something dark and um, terrifying about God's glory. On Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, this is when God is making this, this Mosaic covenant with the people of Israel, how is he described? It says, so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp, what did they do? Trembled. When they saw God's glory on Mount Sinai, they trembled. And then later in Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 through 17, it says, then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud, and to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Psalm 97.2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. There is something absolutely horrifying, if I can use that term, about God's glory in our humanity. Now, praise the Lord as we read in the New Testament and we read in verse 17 that we can make requests to the same God. We understand that's only through Jesus Christ. But there is something seriously fearful about God's glory. And it is represented in that he is not only associated with light, he is associated with darkness to bring out the light part, his majesty, but also the mystery, the unknown things of God that we can't even begin to understand. We will never understand all that God is. 
but we can know him in a personal and intimate way. And so with the time we have, uh, we'll have to stop there. And we've looked at the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that because Christ became human, we can have a personal relationship with God. And this God that we want to know something about is ultimately glorious and amazing. And the more we can put that into our personal lives and understand that and grow in our relationship with him through that, the better we can know him, the more we can grow. And so we will begin looking at the next part of that verse in verse 17 as we pick up next week on the knowledge of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a glorious God and that we can study your word and understand something about what it means that you're glorious. Lord, we see that you are so far above us. You are truly transcendent. And yet, Lord, we are so thankful that you are near and you are close and we can know you and that your presence has dwelt with Israel in the past and this very day you dwell within each believer through your spirit. Lord, we are grateful for that. We can't even begin to understand just how amazing that fact is. But help us as we study your word and we grow in our knowledge of you to make these things useful in our lives. And Lord, we know that um, ultimately your plans are good and that we can look forward to those with joy. Lord, we just pray for that joy to be a part of our lives today. We pray this in your name. Amen.